I represent the Heinz Center and thereby the Heinz Center's bipartisan initiative for the prevention of breast cancer. And I am a total zealot on the subject and I'm rocking this pink shirt for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not a session merely about breast cancer. It is a session about breast cancer, about women's cancers, and indeed about the range of family chronic illnesses whose incidence we are seeing today increasing at a rate spectacularly greater than the rate of increase in the general population. This moment in history, it seems to me, requires science to be sure, and we're going to hear of new advances in science that provide us with new information as to the causation of these chronic diseases and, we hope, to steps to their prevention. But it is a moment for science and it is a moment as well for civic bravery. And I think all of us who are non-professionals, non-physicians, non-scientists, active citizens, it really is time for us to be unafraid and to speak for a new national research agenda, an agenda that takes our spectacular national advances in detection and treatment and applies that genius or those collective geniuses to the task of prevention and public health. This is one of the challenges of our time and it gives me great pleasure to be a small participant in it. Allow me please to introduce uh, the representatives of our three co-sponsors. Uh, the, I was going to say, the immovable force or the irresistible force behind this session really lies in the brain and spirit of Allison Carlson. Allison, I want you to stand up. Of the Forsythia Foundation in San Francisco, California. She is a soldier in this army and a general of the legions, and we are so glad to have you here. Tracy Woodruff, would you stand, please? Tracy is from the University of California School of Medicine and of all the national schools of medicine, and they are many in their high regard. You see, may be the university most in the lead for this common quest. And Tracy, you've been terrific to work with and your commitment both to science and to promulgation of science has been a real joy. Finally, my immediate boss, uh, whom I will praise less fulsomely than the others just for, <laughs> for office decorum, is, uh, is our own scientist uh, and long expert on endocrine systems, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and indeed the whole relationship between environmental health and human health, Dr. Pete Myers. So we are moving from Troika to Troika, and uh, the, uh, the first president that I would like to introduce, she is president of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. When Dr. Conry was sworn in the spring of this year as the 64th president, she declared this, and I'm using her words, the year of the woman. For the first time in the history of the United States, she says, we have agreed that the health of women is a priority, that by investing in this generation, we have invested in the next generation. Dr. Conry? Thank you, I'm very touched because that is the way I believe. ACOG is an organization that represents 57,000 OBGYNs and the women we serve. And that's the most important thing to remember because it is about the women we serve and certainly looking at that investment in this generation and future generations that brings us all here today. We're an organization that is devoted to education, to research, and to advocacy. And all three of those areas are key. Today, we've seen advocacy take place, um, but what led us here is the information, the education that's so important to us. 
I like to jokingly say that it was a leaden lipstick bill that we were asked about a couple of years ago <coughs> that brought us here. We're very involved in preconception health and how do we prepare women for pregnancy, yet when we were asked as the women's health ac experts, what would we say about leaden lipstick, we had no idea. We had no idea what to tell women, we had no idea what to tell our fellows. And it began the very important fellowship um, with UC San Francisco and their expertise. That partnership with UC San Francisco and ACOG is very important, and we have that same bond with other organizations around the United States. But it led to what I consider one of the most important statements that's come out this year, because we are looking at our vulnerable population, the population of women, our underserved women, who often don't have an ability to restrict their exposure to chemicals. It's looking at that um, very vulnerable population, a fetus that's exposed to the environment of a pregnant woman, and it certainly looks at that investment in the future. What ACOG did was take the information that's been around, um, analyzed it, put it together, and said, this is so important, we need to be able to share it with our fellows. So a week ago, we released a committee opinion about reproductive health and the environment. Thank you. <laughs> Based on a committee opinion, we're now able to effectively educate our fellows. We're able to advocate effectively in, in the legislative process. I wasn't going to make any little side comments about that today. Um, <laughs> and we're able to educate our patients. What we're asking, though, is that we have a shift in what's happened. I think all of us can say that there's a backdrop of disease processes that have evolved over the last 30 to 40 years. And those, those, that backdrop, whether we're looking at um, exposure to chemicals, whether we're looking at a backdrop of um, cancers, a backdrop of obesity, many different things, that backdrop is about a 30 to 40 year time span shorter than what it takes to see genetic changes. Over that same time period, we've seen a host of different chemicals being released to the environment, about a 30 to 40 year time span. We can take that and look at some of the very serious associations and say, we need to speak up on behalf of our patients, we need to be in a, a position to advocate for our patients, and we need to step back and say, let's shift the burden of proof. Right now, it's based on that burden of proof is in my lap as a physician, it's in my patient's lap as a consumer, and it's not where it should be. The burden of proof needs to be further up the stream. It needs to be with chemical industries so we know that only safe exposures are taking place. And until we effectively advocate for that burden of proof, we won't have achieved where we need to go. So I thank everybody for your interest in being here tonight. And I'm delighted to say that we've been able to issue a wonderful committee opinion that's got a, a great deal of attention, which has been helpful for all of us. And it's able to allow us to take that next step and advocate on behalf of women. Thank you. Our next president is Dr. Linda Judas, uh, who is an MD, PhD, as is Dr. Connery, a double barrel doctor, really just. And watch out. I'm going to tell my mother. Um, Dr. Judas represents the nationally and internationally recognized leader for multidisciplinary information, advocacy, and standard setting in the general field of reproductive health. The Society has been instrumental in supporting the establishment of contraceptive and infertility research centers and supports research across the board in reproductive medicine in such areas as menopause and general women's health. She is an obstetrician, gynecologist, and reproductive endocrinologist. So Dr. Linda Judas, we are pleased to have you with us. Thank you very much, uh, and I want to thank the Heinz Center for this invitation. Um, and it's a thrill to be here. As president of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, um, this organization has, as you've heard, has been at the forefront of advocacy, 
and also uh, putting together practice guidelines, evidence-based medicine based on science. Um, with regard to environmental effects on reproductive health and health more broadly, our organization, we founded a special interest group in um, reproductive health and, envir and environment and reproductive health special interest group, which then allowed us and enabled us to have postgraduate courses, to have a special section in the annual meeting where our abstracts and communications uh, would be labeled with environment. So to put a spotlight on the environment as a variable in medicine. I don't think we're quite there yet. As Dr. Conry mentioned, we really need to promote advocacy and to change the way chemicals, certainly, that enter our, um, our country and our states and our environment are regulated. The committee opinion that Dr. Conry mentioned that was released last week was a um, collaboration also with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and also was in collaboration with um, the Program for Reproductive Health and the Environment at the University of California, San Francisco uh, under the leadership of Dr. Tracy Woodruff. This is really precedent setting to get the message out that the professional organizations who are basing their opinions on science have said there's a problem here and we need to pay attention to it. The goal is not to frighten patients, it's to inform them. It's also to inform our health care professionals. Most medical schools talk about estrogens and their interactions with the estrogen receptor, but they never mention endocrine disrupting chemicals. Everyone learns about the thyroid, but we don't teach about thyroid disruptors. We're all aware of the epidemic of obesity and metabolic syndrome, and yet we don't really talk about the obesogens. And in fact, if you do, people sort of look at you with a funny look. It's our responsibility. I, see, I feel this as a healthcare professional and also as a faculty member in our institution at UCSF to educate the next generation. It's time for the American Board of OBGYN to be putting questions about um, environmental chemicals and their effects on reproductive health as part of the certification process. We need to incorporate this into our education system. And it's not just for doctors, it's also for nurses and more broadly for educating the public. It's been my experience that women who are, and men, who are thinking about uh, pregnancy, and that's the population I see mostly with infertility, want to maximize their ability to become pregnant and to maximize the health and well-being of their children. The same is true of pregnant women, and the same is true of pregnant women whether they live here in Chevy Chase or they live in East Oakland in California. So our responsibility, I believe, is to educate across the board everyone based, again, on science. So you may ask how I got involved with all of this. Um, it actually was a discussion uh, with a um, collaborator, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Uh, this is Allison Carlson. I will call her doctor. <laughs> who really challenged my thinking about, well, you see all these patients with infertility and you're an endocrinologist, what about all these things that seem to act like estrogens? And that really gave birth, if you will, to a wonderful collaboration that has lasted over a decade. Um, and we put together uh, a symposium, a workshop uh, called the Vallambrosa Workshop in Menlo Park, California, and we invited scientists, we invited physicians, we invited um, patient advocates, and we invited policymakers. And those four groups rarely cross each other's paths on a daily basis. Um, and when we started, we were in a room like this with the chairs just the way they are, and by the end of the day and a half, we were in a circle because we wanted to talk to each other and that really has been, an ex that was an extraordinary experience and it's given birth to um, a lot more interest. 
So in addition to ACOG and ASRM, the Endocrine Society, I'm sure you'll hear from Dr. Stanton, issued in 2009 the, um, a white paper essentially on endocrine disruptors. And the take home message was there is enough scientific evidence for us as professionals to think about something is up here and we need to do something. And the word is spreading and I hope that the Heinz Center will continue in its excellent work that's bipartisan, based on science, and is to preserve the environment and to promote health. And I hope that we can continue uh, these types of conversations and collaborations. Thank you very much. Our final guest and our final president is a president to be, uh, currently the president-elect and next year will be the president emeritus, but soon on the threshold of, <laughs> of full presidency is uh, Richard Santon, Dr. Richard Santon, who is the president-elect of the Endocrine Society. Um, as Dr. Judas just made clear, the Endocrine Society over the last few years has played an enormously influential role in bringing to the attention of both medical colleagues, scientific colleagues, and indeed policymakers, the fact that endocrine disruption is real, that there are chemicals which can be implied in, its, in this disruption, and you, have, you and your society have taken the lead on this, and uh, we are all in your debt. Um, the Endocrine Society is the world's oldest, largest, and most active organization devoted to research on hormones and the clinical practice of endocrinology. International body, more than 16,000 members from over 100 countries, and they represent professionals dedicated to research and treatment of the full range of endocrine disorders, including but not limited to, but a list, diabetes, reproduction, infertility, osteoporosis, thyroid disease, obesity, growth hormone, pituitary tumors, and I'm running out of breath, adrenal insufficiency. Doctor, enlighten us some more. Thank you very much. Really pleased to be here. And I have to say that, that uh, the president of the Endocrine Society, Teresa Woodruff, is in Europe. Uh, she was very sad that she couldn't be here, but she really has her heart in this work uh, uh, as well. And the Endocrine Society is very pleased to join the other two members of the Troika here uh, th this evening. My career has really been in research and in clinical practice. And I've been very interested in this whole area because breast cancer prevention is really my passion. Uh, going forward in the next few years, that's why I'm funded and we have been looking at a number of these, uh, a number of these issues. We know that reproductive health and endocrinology are really inexorably linked, and many, if not most, chemicals can in some way or another interfere with, uh, with reproduction. And of course, we call these endocrine disruptive chemicals. So there are a lot of implications of this, as, as we've talked about, medical, uh, policy, uh, governmental, and so on. But I think one has to ask what the endocrine society really uh, brings, brings to this. I think that, that the, the fact that the very first scientific statement that the Endocrine Society put out, we started this in 2009, of all of the various aspects that you talked about, uh, the adrenal, pituitary, reproduction, and so on, the Endocrine Society chose to write a scientific statement on endocrine disruptors. Uh, Linda Giudici was one of the uh, authors of this. Uh, Andrea Gore was the uh, uh, was the lead author. But I think that, that this really pulled together a wide body of information uh, that was scattered at that time, but it also focused on the real difficulty in studying uh, endocrine disruptors, and it led the Endocrine Society to put on a, another position paper later, which was really a roadmap. How should government, how should com companies, how should scientists begin to approach this uh, from, many, uh, from many different points of view. So I think that, that uh, one of the critical things here is that we do pull together a number of organizations 
we all have different interests and we all have different uh, uh, specialties, but if we can focus it on this, uh, this issue, I think we will move forward much more rapidly. So the scientific and medical organizations, and that's what's represented here, really can't do this alone. We need the help and we need the commitment of conscientious policymakers. And all of you are involved in this uh, to, to a greater or, or lesser extent. And I think as, as the others have emphasized, we really have to ground our observations in science. We have the tools now in endocrinology to really figure out how things are, are, are working. And there's been a lot of conflicting information about endocrine disruptors in the literature. We're beginning, I think, to understand a little bit better how to parse out the various, uh, uh, the various aspects of how this works. So what do we tell our regulatory agencies? Well, I think for sure, as was mentioned before, they need to look at all of the chemicals in some way as a screening process to find out which of these are potentially uh, regulating uh, 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 hormonal uh, aspects. And the Endocrine Society has taken a, a relatively unique view of this, I think, not just to look at the adverse effects of, of these chemicals, but to say if it works physiologically or it works on a system, it may not be an adverse effect, but in the right circumstances or in the right doses or in the right individuals, there is a potential for an adverse effect. If we're talking about a two-year-old girl, uh, plastic uh, uh, material, bisphenol, might be very different in that individual than in, in a woman who's ovulating whose estrogen levels are 10,000-fold higher than would be in this, uh, in this other in individual. So how can this... Uh, how can we approach this? Well, the underlying biologic reasons uh, for this complexity uh, and these technical problems, uh, they were discussed in, in great detail, I think, in our uh, scientific statement. But most people like to think about this simply. You have a chemical, it binds in a lock, that lock turns, it, it causes the door to open, and that's the receptor hormone interaction. But it's not just that. These chemicals are metabolized into compounds, and estrogens can do this, that bind directly to DNA and can alter the DNA over time. This can cause mutations. If that happens, these mutations can be passed on uh, to the next generation, potentially, so we need to think about the germline mutations. It can alter the, the way that DNA uh, is silenced. Some parts of DNA are silenced, some are active. My wife say, says that I need to be silenced a little more often than, uh, than some. But this epigenetic changes of, the, uh, uh, of DNA is another way that these endocrine disruptors can alter uh, uh, effects over a long period of time. And then it's not just the receptors. Uh, we know that, that some of these chemicals can be converted into other activities. My own area is aromatase, that's the enzyme that converts male hormones into female hormones, these same, same enzymes can convert endocrine disruptors into compounds that actually can be toxic and cause DNA damage. So we can't just look at the short-term effects in vitro, but we have models to do that, and the Endocrine Society has pointed out ways that, that we can screen for some of the specific mechanisms. But we also need to, to look at these compounds then in animals, and we need to look not only at the short-term effects, but at some of the longer-term effects. Gail Prince, who works at the University of Chicago, has shown that exposure uh, of male rats to estrogen in terms of prostate cancer will have effects throughout the lifetime uh, of those animals. So we have to figure out ways, uh, basically, to, uh, to study this. And the Endocrine Society position paper last year, I think provided a roadmap of all the different ways that, that this could be done, providing a practical approach to this. So I think together, uh, all of us, and with the help of important partners like the Heinz Center, the scientific and medical communities can be a powerful voice for improved public policies that have such profound impact on the health of our nation's people. But a voice is only as effective as the listener who hears it. I like the analogy of the, of the circle, because you hear this initially, and when you get into it, this is such a complex but very interesting area 
that then we need to have individuals from all disciplines listening to this. And we have to learn how to frame our concepts so that our uh, advocacy groups and the, uh, and the uh, regulators and so on can really understand what we're talking about. And I think this is a major issue. So thank you very much for, for listening. I don't think there's anything uh, better than an event that is both educational and galvanizing. So let's have a final round of applause for our three presidents. Thank you so much. <laughs>